Frank Eliason joins us, the keynote for Customer Experience Management Asia 2017, September 12th through the 14th. First, some supporters to thank, and thank you for listening. This episode is supported by CCW Digital, leaders responsible for operations, information technology, contact centers, customer care, service, and support are invited to register for a free CCW Digital membership. Membership includes networking with 100,000 plus qualified industry professionals, quarterly executive research reports, product matchmaking, and more. Go to ccwdigital.com to join the community. This episode is also supported by the CCW Conference and Expo. The event will empower you to test, learn, and try the next big thing in customer experience optimization. Are you interested in mining data across touch points for personalized and predictive data? Are you trying to integrate your systems to get a more complete view of the customer? Are you figuring out what innovations to invest in? Chatbots, virtual assistants, AI, VR, biometrics, to name a few? Go to callcenterweek.com to register. On his way to keynote, Customer Experience Management Asia 2017, Frank Eliason joins us stateside and takes us through his thinking about how global society is behaving currently and what that means for customer experience. As he says, he's been watching customer experience since before they called it customer experience. He notes that globally we're creating these big CX fiefdoms, but we then retract because CX isn't delivering quickly enough. Frank shares that he should have paid more attention in psychology class. His thought is that in addition to paying attention to the customer's experience, organizations should be paying attention to the employee's experience. Frank adds that when you newly focus on customer experience as a deliverable, you're going against the grain of not only your customers, but your employees as well. Welcome to CCW Digital on B2B IQ. I'm your host, Seth Adler. Download episodes on ccwdigital.com or through our app and iTunes within the iTunes podcast app in Google Play or wherever you currently get your podcasts. Frank Eliason. Correct me up. Yeah. I am um, happy to be sitting here in New York City, right, with Frank Eliason. I should ask you if I'm pronouncing that correct. You got it right. All right. So, uh, or correctly, for that matter. <laughs> uh, so you and I are here, and we're going to go there, right, to CEM Asia. Absolutely. And so we figured while we're here, why not just say hello? Let's have a chat. What do you know about customer experience? No. That type of thing. Exactly. <laughs> but you know, you look around and you see what's happening all over the globe mm -hmm. and you know and you could put even customer experience off to the side. You see polarization. Sure. You see you know, a lot of people who have their ideas and they're putting it out there uh, in different ways. Sure. And usually someone outcome coming against it in many ways. Right. You know, people are asking, what do we know about customer experience? And I've been watching customer experience before they called it customer experience. One of the things I, I've noticed, and you see it in the States, and you even see it in Asia, is we're creating all these big fiefdoms of customer experience. Uh -huh. Then, at times, we retract from that. It's not delivering. And if you go online, you can find people who go, customer experience doesn't deliver. It does deliver. And they'll fight about it. Right. What are the answers? And I think we can bring the answers to them. You know, I think you know, one of the things I say is, like to say is I should have paid more attention to psychology in school. Fair enough. It's a psychology game. Right. Not even just psychology. You know, oftentimes in customer experience, we think it's psychology with the customer. Uh -huh. I would say it's more psychology within the organization. How do you mean? That's interesting. Well, what happens is... You know, one of the, we've watched customer experience have these ebb and flows in companies. Mm -hmm. There's a major firm here in the United States that brought me in to speak to them a few years ago. And, uh, you know, they have cell phones. Uh, they're my provider, but they're, they also do some other businesses. Got it. And the guy was, you know, creating this new customer experience thing. He has this new, you large group, and they're going to really change everything about customer experience. And I got done speaking. He came to me and said, yeah, but how, how, when am I going to get this? When am I going to see all this great benefits? I turned to him and said, if you're lucky, 10 years. Right. And he turned white <laughs> and was <laughs> turning me out. No, no, now. I need this yeah, now. Got to be in the next three months exactly. here, Exactly. And this is one of the problems in business. We're looking out three months as yeah. opposed to 10 years, but that's a whole other conversation. Right. And I said to him, yeah, but what's going to happen is you're going against the grain of the people that have been doing it for a while. Mm-hmm. 
and you're going to tell them they're doing it wrong. They're going to fight you every step of the way. In your own organization. Exactly. Right. This is nothing even to get to the point of with a customer. And so, he, oh, oh, you're wrong. He, ca- he told me I was wrong. Yeah. I said, okay, I hope I'm wrong. Right. Well, your wife tells you you're wrong all the time, right? That, so you're used to that. Yeah, exactly. That's easy. Exactly. Well, we're, what, two years out? His whole organization is no longer with the company. There you go. This is what happens. And it's not to discourage anyone, but this is his, the challenge there was understanding not just the customer, but understanding all the different layers in the company and how to speak to them. So I just, you know, there's a, there's a new one which features Richard Branson, mm-hmm. which might be old, but it's new to me, <laughs> which says uh, the customer is not the most important person. Mm-hmm. Your employee is the most important person. And they, they are. First of all, if you treat your employees right, they treat customers right. You can look at any company that is centered on customer experience that's considered to be at the top of their game. Virgin's historically been one of them. Mm-hmm. They typically have empowered employees. You know, oftentimes we say companies like a Ritz-Carlton. You know, why? Because their employees are empowered. Mm-hmm. And I will say most of the time, and this is not going to be all, and this is why you really need to understand your business, mm-hmm. You know, but if you're a company that is a service-oriented company, mm-hmm. your employee experience is more important than your customer experience. You have employees who love to work there. They will show that. They will actually live everything you want. Because the product is them, essentially. That is correct. Right. Now, we can sit there and shift gears and say, but what if you're not? Maybe you're a product-driven company. Sure. Well, employee experience is still going to be extraordinarily important. But it, you know, think about it from a, even a design perspective. Mm-hmm. And you know, some designers out there are going to take offense to this. But the best designs and the best ways of doing things, the best way of being inspired, doesn't always come from the designer. In fact, most designers will tell you they get inspired elsewhere. Mm-hmm. Whether it be looking at a building, looking at a piece of art. I will tell you they also get inspired talking to another employee. Right. You know, if they talk to an employee who's very passionate about the product, starts to talk about, they're going to walk away inspired. Yeah. So there might not be, you know, a product uh, employee experience that is all about they treat me so great, but it will be about that I'm empowered to think about these things and actually talk to the right people. Taking it all the way out, if I'm designing a cell phone, I the last thing I'm going to be inspired by is a cell phone. That's right. Well, and and Steve Jobs, I you know. Is a great example there you go. of things. If he were to have designed an iPhone the way we thought of phones, we'd have a keyboard on there. Yeah. We would not have this visual experience. No. And look what happened since then. Now finding a phone that has a keyboard is virtually impossible. You'd have something between a Motorola and a BlackBerry. <laughs> exactly. And I just saw, like, my brother-in-law actually had a BlackBerry. I'm like, they still make them? <laughs> I was completely shocked. But, you know, you have you have to actually understand the psychology of your customer when you're designing that. Sure, he understood that. You know, I don't, I'm not certain if Apple's quite there today, but that's a whole other conversation sure. and a whole other speech. Sure, but where I do think is at that time, he understood what people wanted, mm-hmm. and he understood that it was this visual experience of the internet that was more important than the keyboard. Mm-hmm. And it's really funny because we are at the 10th anniversary of the iPhone. Yeah. And so all those old reviews are coming back. Yeah. And the original reviews were, this is horrible. It doesn't have a keyboard. What's wrong with this thing? Exactly. What are they thinking over there? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> you know, and so, you know, but I will tell you, there's other things like that. Yeah. Uh, one of the things that's on the market nowadays that I think is the next big thing. So if you talk to these, you know, so-called tech futurists and all that stuff, and mm. I've been called that at times too, which I don't get. But you know, you talk to these futurists, and they'll be like, oh, VR and AR and all this stuff. Sure. Eh, I, I, yes, I get it. It's kind of interesting things you can do with it. Those are you tools. Can, they're tools. You might make something cool. Yeah. But what, you have to think differently. You have to think what's the value to the end user. What are you actually doing? Exactly. Yeah. And that's where I would say is, it was really funny because people were talking all about that at the time the uh, Amazon Echo came out. Sure. I used the, I had the Amazon Echo the first week it came out. Uh-huh. And I will tell you, I immediately said this is a game changer. Why is it a game changer? Because it took me away from my phone. It took me away from my screen. Mm. 
It, it changed it, your behavior. It changed my behavior. It yeah. made it easy. Instead of going to look up something on, on typing all this stuff on my phone, I turn to Alexa and say, Alexa, can you tell me about Frank Eliason? And she will. <laughs> The, qu- the question is, what is she going to say, Frank, right? You know? <laughs> Sometimes you give funny answers. <laughs> so I, The one I, answer for me is actually pretty safe. So Yeah. <laughs> and, and I want to kind of get to— I should have probably used a different example. There, but. <laughs> well, that's fine. I want to get to kind of your background and, and yeah. how we have the pleasure yeah. of speaking with you today. But as I'm hearing it, I hear three kind of Venn diagram circles, mm-hmm. which is your employees, mm-hmm. your customer, mm-hmm. and— you did mention your business. You have mm-hmm. to understand your business. What do you mean by that? Well, this gets actually quite fascinating. I yeah. am a big believer that you have to understand your business. And I'll go a little personal here. Okay. Uh, my, my family, my in-laws, own a radio station. Uh-huh. If you really look around, radio is extraordinarily disrupted. We, we're on a podcast right we're now. We're on a podcast. Exactly. It's all now on Internet. You don't need the airways as much as you used to. I listen pretty much streaming on everything. Yeah. And I sat there, people still listen on the radio. Oh, don't tell them that. That's fine. But, yeah. no, people, you know, on the radio, that's not that common, at least for my generation and younger. Right. I get older than that, they do. Yeah. But think about radio. I've watched in the United States, it, radio stations have tried to become more like the internet stations or the satellite radio. They centralized everything. Mm-hmm. They became less local. Right. Which is... A- the death knell. That's their death. That's right. They put themselves out of business. Right, yeah. First and foremost, what I advise every company is very simplistic. First of all, who are you and what are you? What? Why did you become what you did? Mm-hmm. Go back to the beginning. Right. Shocking thing in radio, the radio stations that my family own are quite old. I can go back and look at the history of the 1920s and 1930s when they were established. Uh-huh. One of the shocking things I found was... Pictures always in the community. You know, I don't know how they did it back then. Right. I have no clue how they broadcast from within the community because today with cell phone technology and everything else, it's easy. But the bottom line is the picture of that business. The picture of the business was there, dead center on Main Street. The fact is, go back in history, that's what it was about. Mm -hmm. That's what would help radio if they would recognize the benefit is local. Yeah. So my point to this is... Every business was started for a reason. You need to actually drill back to that basic aspect Mm -hmm. and really understand that. You can then move it forward, but you move it forward based upon what that core is. Mm -hmm. The core is if it's about being local, then you know what? You need to become more local in a technology-driven world. Right. You know, these are the things that you do. It doesn't mean that you have to be, you know, if you're Kodak and go, oh, well, we have to concentrate more on, you know, this ink. No, why were you created in the first place? They were actually created to bring the world to you, mm-hmm. bring these images to you. Mm-hmm. You get back to what your core was about, the technology to do it is meaningless. The, the, they could have started with VR, Kodak. Yeah, that's right. And it wouldn't have mattered because – It would have fit who they were well, though because like, the reality was you – know, but instead they got caught up in – you know, we're we're about making this these p- image these pictures that are using this ink or chemicals. They went the wrong about way chemicals. with image, right? Yeah, yeah. we're about chemicals. And right. It's like, no, you're not about chemicals. You're about the image. You're itself. about the image itself, right? Yeah. And so, one of the things is going back and understanding that. Yeah, that would have made it easy for them to go. You know what? We have to get into this digital technology. They would have been first into VR. That is correct. Yeah, yeah. It's simple. Yeah, but yet. The hard part or companies Polaroid have, would have been exactly right. The hard part to these companies is oftentimes the founders are no longer with them, mm-hmm. and when once the founder leaves a company, they forget why they were there in the first place, and they get to this way of thinking about this quarter, next quarter, and that's about it. How much of that has to do with communication? So you know that entrepreneur, that founder, mm-hmm. uh, inherently understands what's happening, and then kind of the rest of the organization understands it, but only viscerally, Mm -hmm. as opposed to it being put down in bullet point form. Uh, It it needs to actually be lived. So one of my first job experience, not my first job experience, but like I'll say in the real business world, was with a company that's known as Vanguard Investments. They're an international investment company. Mm -hmm. They're one of the largest investment companies. 
One of the things that was interesting about them was, A, they were founded because their CEO got fired from their last job, so he wound up kind of, in a way, taking it over <laughs> in a strange way. Okay. But they're actually owned by the people that own their investments, so they're mutually owned. But one of the things that he established was everybody that worked there always needed to work on the phones in a certain amount of week, including him. Okay. So new CEO came, comes on board. Guess what? They were still required to do the same things. Mm -hmm. So – and to this day, they are still required all the way up to the CEO to be that close to the customer. Right. Point being is it was built into their culture yeah. to be this customer-centric and always be hearing what is going on. doesn't mean that the, the new CEOs over the years don't put their mark on things. They do. But at the end of the day, that mark is still centered on that customer for that organization. Mm -hmm. And it's because – they have built into their culture, you're going to listen to calls. You're not only listen, you're going to be in those calls. Right. And so, you know, every organization is a little bit different. Mm -hmm. But you, you really do need to understand how that works. And even in Asia, you know, I've done a lot of work in Asia. Asia is very technologically advanced in many ways. You know, sometimes a little excited on certain technologies, but they're definitely advanced. And you've seen different things take a hold faster than they have in other parts of the globe. Okay. That it's great to use that to your benefit. Mm -hmm. You know, there's a lot of cool stuff you can try in Asia sure. that if you tried to do in other parts of the globe won't happen. Why? Uh, for a variety of reasons, I think Asia is more open to trying these things. I think, you know, if you can look at like things like uh, the European Union, there's a lot of privacy rules, there's a lot of a lot of different rules that they put in place. And that's because of Europeans, your, the history in Europe, mm -hmm. but it's also an uneasiness. So you can't really try as much there. Okay. In Asia, there is an openness within the people. They really get excited about the technology. Mm -hmm. And I would make the case that it also started because it was, you know, with the phone generation, they're built there. They're, it was a lot more less expensive than buying a computer. So people, almost everybody has the phone. And so everybody the, went mobile. Immediately. They went mobile yeah. immediately. They jumped on that mm. faster than any other area that I've witnessed. Mm -hmm. And so they also are willing to try various messaging apps and various other aspects. And companies themselves are jumping on board of all these things. I think one of the things is it's understanding in Asia you can try these things. Mm -hmm. But it's also then understanding if you're a global organization, how that connects through the globe. Or doesn't, because mm -hmm. in many cases it won't. Right. Uh, but it's also going back to why are you doing it? Mm -hmm. What is the, your purpose? Oh, it's cool. Then you're probably going to eventually find failure. I'm doing it because this is what we're about and these are the, the customer. Now you're getting yeah, somewhere. Right. Now you're starting to understand. So within Asia, there is a lot of technology. It's definitely a technology-driven culture. Mm -hmm. And so you can play into the, that very well. Start with why is your business start in the, is there in the first place? Mm -hmm. Then from there, you actually can then you know put it in play. I've witnessed whole new ways of doing payments. You know, we talk. In, I can, a lot of people don't realize my background. When they look up things, they'll find Comcast. But my background is actually <laughs> financial <laughs> services. Right. You said Comcast, Vanguard, right? Yeah, Vanguard, <laughs> Citibank was. Uh, you know, and one of the things I'll tell you is. In the payment and fintech space, yeah. a lot of the coolest stuff happens in Asia. Mm -hmm. Now, doesn't mean it's all taken hold. Right. It you know the things that have tended to take hold yeah. were done where it was core to what that company was about, mm -hmm. and it made sense from a customer perspective because it was easy. Yeah. Which the easy thing is the other component. Okay. Which is you know in payments is a great example. You know everybody and their mother tried to do payments. Sure. There's companies still trying to do payments. Then PayPal? Is that? Oh, PayPal. But even they got disrupted with Apple Pay. I okay, mean, sure. You know, why does Apple Pay work and say some of these other payment methods don't? Well, because I don't have to open up anything and I just go Click. flip it out and it's there. Yep. But I will actually tell you if you look in the States, that doesn't even work that much mm -hmm. because, you know, if you look around, even place where there's Apple Pay, most people still pull out the old plastic. Card, yeah. Now, in, in over in Asia, they don't. They actually do use a lot of these different payment methods. Phone, phone. Phone, whatever. Right. And there's a few different components for the reasons for those differences. In the United States, the technology to actually read what's there 
was never perfected. So it's a user experience is not that great and it's not accepted in enough places. So what happens is they go to try it, it doesn't work yeah. and they do it in some other place and it doesn't work and they're like, oh, forget this. And so they we stop. tried to change their behavior. I'm trying yeah. to change my behavior. No, it doesn't work. Okay, yeah. fine. Here's the card. Whereas over in Asia, because it was so dedicated to mobile, you know, a huge chunk of their population not scared of the mobile device. Mm-hmm. Here, wow. they're, you know, if you watch, some people are like scared of their mobile device. They don't even want to play with it. Mm. Over there, they, they, oh, yeah, play Boom. with mobile. Yep. Done. And, but the ones that were most successful in that payment fintech space, it was all easy. It wasn't about opening another app or doing this other thing. It was done. Seamless. Seamless, mm-hmm. exactly. Or what I like to say, frictionless. Okay. And this is where, you know, if you think about almost anything in business, payments is a great example, but almost anything, there's friction. We create friction in everything we do. Mm-hmm. And we tend to do this in business. We talked earlier in this interview about, you know, understanding psychology within your company. Mm-hmm. You have to remember, every one of those little fiefdoms is trying to do something to make themselves look better, sure. smarter, yep. whatever it may be. So their bosses, like, love them. Mm-hmm. Get it. But the problem to that is... They're, at the end of the day, causing friction because the customer doesn't view you as all these little fiefdoms in the company. They view you as your company overall. Right. And so think about this. When we think frictionless, even an app, I now have to download an app. Mm -hmm. I now need to then find it on my phone. Sure, where is it? Open this app. Yep. Every one of those steps is friction. Mm -hmm. Now get back to that Amazon Echo example. Done. Instead of that, if I just said... Hey, Alexa, get me this. Mm -hmm. Or actually, you can buy off of it. Alexa, order me this paper. Yep. Boom. Play this song. Play this song. Yeah. Frictionless. Yeah. That is where we need to get to. Mm -hmm. And we have to be very mindful. Whenever we're looking at customer experience, almost every step of the way, are we adding friction? Mm Mm-hmm. Maybe we're adding friction inter- inside the organization. Maybe we're adding friction right. outside the organization. In, in setting up to take your, uh, you know, initial example in setting up this organization, all he was doing essentially Bet. was setting setting up, adding hey. friction, adding friction, adding exactly. Friction. Yeah, that's exactly it, yeah. and that's the problem to customer experience organizations. Yeah, you became a friction within that organization. Yeah. And that's it's the opposite of what you were trying to do. Exactly. And so we have to step back a little bit with customer experience yeah. and understand within this psychology, how do we make ourselves in the organization frictionless? There you go. And then how do we make the customer experience frictionless? All right. So let's make sure we understand your background. You said one of your first jobs at Vanguard, mm-hmm. which is makes a lot of sense, right? Mm-hmm. This is an organization that's built on, the, you know, us being on the front lines <laughs> with the customer. So that makes sense that that's an initial thing. You said you have a fair amount of uh, financial services mm-hmm. experience. We'll go into that. But where are you from originally? Uh, so I grew up in Philadelphia uh-huh. and so lived in Philadelphia my entire life. Right. You know, my so you've, we've got – I just need to make sure yeah. that it's a Broad Street Bullies for you it, and the oh, Philadelphia yeah. Phillies. <laughs> you know who Von Hayes is, for instance. <laughs> yes, right? yes, you I actually do. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> There's a name I haven't heard in a long time. You know, but, yeah, and we're rough and tumble. Yeah. But the interesting thing is – and this gets back to the psychology things. Philadelphia has a interesting reputation in the United States and sometimes around the globe mm-hmm. as being this tough – this is a city that threw snowballs at Santa Claus. I was going to say it if you did <laughs> And so, you know, that's the reputation Philadelphia often has. But people don't always understand that. And, you know, it's really interesting. We're sitting here in New York. A lot of people love New York. Mm -hmm. I actually love Philadelphia. I just moved back to Philadelphia. And, you know, there's a reason I love Philadelphia. And that is, as a community, the community is actually all for one. Mm -hmm. And they tend to, if you come into there and say a New York Giants fan comes into Oh, forget it. Don't go. Don't go. Exactly. (laughs) But, But the reason being is... They're against the community, yeah. and the community will all stand up against You're the, trying to disrupt our thing here. That's right. Yeah. And so that's the neat part about Philadelphia is it's that tight-knit. Even though it's a pretty big city, yeah. it's still tight-knit community. And they're also about reducing friction. We're not so yeah. intru- I- interested in whatever you're bringing in Exactly. Here. So, And a lot of customers are like that in a lot of things you do, so you have to understand that. But the key is it's also remembering we're all a product of our own histories. Mm-hmm. So my history actually is important in this scenario because sure. I'm not your everyday 
person that you get in business. All right. So what was your position at, at Vanguard? You were a low-level guy, so I, it doesn't I, even matter. Right. right. Well, I'll, I'll, I'll go into that. Yeah. You know, so I actually do not have a college degree, which you is quite, sh- quite shocking to it a is. lot of people. And there's a variety of reasons for that, one of which is I'm not necessarily one who's going to color in the lines. Okay. I tend to take my own path and sure. always have. Sure. With some professors that work great. Yeah. Others, let's just say, not so great. Right, right. And that's okay. Yeah. Um, but then, you know, I went into retail management. So I actually have a love for the retail business. Well, was that city or? No, I worked. For, so I worked in retail itself. I worked for Gordon Taylor and Macy's in management before joining Vanguard. So oh, wow. Vanguard was after that, basically, after working 80 hour plus weeks. Sure. Uh, working in stores, I realized this was probably not scalable for me. No, but what <laughs> did you learn though? Because that being on the front lines in retail, in store. It, exactly. I learned a few different things, which is interesting. Cause like right now, department stores, especially in the United States are getting crushed. Yeah. And people are sitting there saying it's Amazon's fault. I will be the first to tell you not Amazon's fault. Hmm. When I was a kid, Going into a department store was an experience. Sure. You even dressed up for it at times. Mm-hmm. You usually would have dinner or lunch there. Mm-hmm. You know, it was a full day experience. What happened over the years is it became pilot high, make it fly. Mm-hmm. It became concentrated on the numbers. I need to get my quarterly numbers. Mm-hmm. Well, that made it where it's not an experience. In fact, most of the department stores in the United States are dumps. Mm-hmm. They're not that interesting to go into. Mm-hmm. They all look alike, and they all just have piled on merchandise when i worked in department stores at the beginning of those that stages but the reality was it was still trying to have this nice experience going through renovations making the stores look nice mm-hmm. you know i was at a lord and taylor that just opened up so lord and taylor is not global but it's a very nice ladies uh brand. actually now they have men's too mm-hmm. but it's a very nice department store of clothing mm-hmm. and it, it was you know starting up in new york on fifth avenue it was an experience yeah well, in the time I worked there, it was piled high, and it was, you know, it was not that good of an experience. It wasn't right. this special. It was no different than going into any other department store, and at that point, I might as well go to some off-price. And how can you expect the customer to want something different if you're not giving them something different? Exactly, and I, I respected back then the visual appeals that you did. they did strive to create that went away over the years. So I was able to also look at these department stores and go, mm. Oh, they used to have like a visual manager who would make sure this would look great. And I obviously knew th- through restructuring, they didn't have that quite as much in these stores. So I think I misspoke. I said, how can you mm. uh, w- have the customer want something different? How can you have the customer want what you are giving them if yeah. you're not providing something different? You, yeah. You have to be something different. You have to be delivering something. And my case, I would say in department stores, they need to deliver that experience that makes you want to go there. So you throw it all away. You go to Vanguard. You're like, mm. forget about this. Yeah. So, I, I, well, actually, the funny thing is I went to an insurance company. I was there for three months, yeah. literally got laid off. They laid off my whole entire department. Right. It's the best three months I had because I literally got three-month pay, <laughs> got paid for those three months, yeah. got an additional three months' pay Excellent. for getting laid off, and went to work for Vanguard a week later. Got it. Um, but Vanguard was the greatest experience because they're mutually owned and highly dedicated to the customer, mm-hmm. which is ingrained in what I do. Right. And so I, I was brought up in this, you know, if you had an issue at Vanguard and you thought we were doing the wrong thing for the customer, you could actually not just tell your boss, mm. you could tell the CEO. Mm-hmm. In fact, they did some interesting things. I said earlier how they would have someone actually sit on the CEO and have to take phone calls. Mm-hmm. They would also take their best um, agents on the phones. And one of the rewards would, would be you would actually help the executives while the, you know they were taking calls. Sure. And so there was this area called Swiss Army, and people would – you would be able to sit there and tell the CEO they were doing it wrong and actually help them do it right. Amazing. Uh, and so you got that interaction. You don't see that in many companies. You yeah. don't see the C-suite as close to the front line as I did there. It was an important thing for me to learn. Mm-hmm. It was extraordinarily helpful. But the other piece that I found helpful is it taught me the story. Okay. What do you, you know, mean? Uh, and so th- this goes into my – so I went from there, and I went to this company called Advana, which is now out of business, but that's not my fault. Okay. <laughs> but well, – Still not high level enough, right? Yeah. You know? So anyway, I, w- I was actually – I started there leading a phone group and then uh, got promoted into quality and, and customer satisfaction. Uh, 
But actually, while I was there, I actually drove change in the organization okay. and changed the way they did things. They were running themselves as a subprime lender, although they were actually a prime lender. So think about it. If you're, what that means is if you have really good credit, mm-hmm. you expect to be treated a certain way. Sure. They were treating you as if you had bad credit. Huh. And so a company needed a little change. Right, sure. Well, one of the things I learned is I took my experience at Vanguard mm-hmm. and brought that to Advana. And one of the things was driving change using the customer story. I can have data galore. And this is funny because we are every company is all data driven. Sure. Data is the big thing right now. Has to be. I will tell you the only change I've ever seen driven by data is when the data says they're losing money. Okay. Then companies change. Right. Other than that, they really don't change that much. Now, you want to drive change? You want your company to do something different? Put that data off to the side for a moment. Mm-hmm. Tell the customer story. Tell the customer story in their words. And I say it in their words because it's extraordinarily important because it actually gets people to have emotional investment mm. in it. Mm-hmm. When I was at Comcast, which is where I gained my notoriety, right. you know, I would tell stories of Granny Annie, and, and I would say it just like that, and I would say it not only to some lower-level people. I would say it to the CEO. Mm-hmm. Guess how things got changed? It didn't happen because I showed you all these numbers. Right. It happened because I just told you about Granny Annie, and you were offended by it. Mm-hmm. Then you came back and said, well, you want to see the numbers. I went, oh, here's the numbers. I yeah. do have those. Here's the numbers that support this anecdote about your customer, and this exactly. is what your customer is saying about you. That is correct. Yeah. And so I, I was only at – it's really interesting because my career is seems to be filled with Comcast, but I was there for only three years. Oh, wow. Okay. And but during the that city time, before that or after? No, after that. Okay. All right. uh, so I was at Comcast for three years, yeah. and you know it was a fascinating experience. I actually I've been tough on the company since I left there when they've done some bad things. Sure. At the same time, I actually do love the company. Of course. Um, They're you know, a Philadelphia company. That's right. right. Come on. Uh, and I still actually communicate with their CEO and uh, quite, you know often, and he's a really nice guy. A lot of people don't realize that. And they, you know, a little bad co- a company oh. or perceived bad. They think that. CEOs are jerks. Well, it's they're really, not. You know, uh, there have been a couple of things that have come up here which are reminding me of the interview that I had with a guy named Jerry Roberts who runs mm-hmm. retail for Microsoft. Oh. And Ron Johnson came up because he mm-hmm. worked for Ron Johnson under uh, – excuse me. He worked under Ron Johnson at Apple. Yeah. And I realized during the interview – that I only had an understanding of Ron Johnson through news reports. Which is, and that's, I I love that you brought Ron Johnson because he's one of my favorite characters. And what I mean by character, he's not really a character. He's actually a really smart guy. Right. J.C. Penney. Yeah. J.C. Penney, he was brought from Apple after doing an extraordinary job. People should understand. Ron Johnson joined Apple from Target. Mm -hmm. Did a great job at Target. Mm-hmm. Funny thing is Target's now struggling, mm-hmm. and it's all because they don't have Ron. Right. But anyway, then he goes to Apple, does an extraordinary job there. Right. Then he, they bring him into JCPenney, and he starts completely shaking up everything and doing it completely differently uh-huh. and recognizing what's going on in the department store sector. Mm-hmm. This was quite a number of years ago at this point, five, six years ago, whatever it was, more than that. Right. And he's there for about three years, and he starts to develop his plan. He's going to, he starts enacting his plan, which calls for renovating these department stores, getting the pricing to be more normal instead of, oh, we have 50% off today. And it's right. 50% off every day. And it's ridiculous. Right. Getting to a normal, normalized pricing structure. Mm-hmm. What happens? The board all of a sudden is short-term thinking. Mm-hmm. You're losing us money. Right. Our customers aren't coming back. You lied to us. You're out. They get rid of him. Mm-hmm. They bring in a traditionalist. Mm-hmm. So now we're about five years later after they bring in their traditionalist or whatever. I forget the number of years it is. Right. And you look and w- what's going on. Now their new CEO, he's sitting there going, oh, we need to change our stores around. We need to put these stores within stores. You know, and he's saying the stuff that Ron Johnson was already doing. Right. Of course. And now you're so far beyond all this. Yeah. The chances of you coming back are not there anymore. Yeah, right, exactly. You pretty much just killed your company yep. because you stopped what he was doing for five years. He was on the uh, he was before the retail apocalypse of mm-hmm. which we are now in. Mm-hmm. He was ahead of it. He was trying to change the company. He was yeah. trying to change the employees and he was trying to change the customer all at the same time because mm-hmm. he knew that that was what was happening anyway. 
Yep. But then you get hit by short-term thinking. Yep. All of a sudden in the news, I hear that this guy's an idiot. Yep. And then I'm hearing whatever I hear about your, the CEO for Comcast. Yeah. Because why? These are big thinkers. Well, it's against the grain of what people think. Or it's against what would be, you know, people would look at. Mm -hmm. You can look at, you know, the polarized world that we're in. Mm -hmm. What, what do we see we in the started, news? by the way. Yeah. We look at the news cycle. Mm -hmm. What are you going to see? You're going to hear what they think think mm -hmm. you want to hear it. Now, one of the things that we've noticed within news is it now segregates to different places. Sure. And so you'll hear talk certain about news. It goes into those fiefdoms. Mm -hmm. And in those fiefdoms, it's really fascinating. You'll hear completely different news stores. Totally. And so what's, what's going on is all they're doing is trying to play to what they think you want to hear. Mm -hmm. And that happened in Ron Johnson's case, which is they thought Wall Street wanted to hear that, you know what, everything's fine. We're making he's money. He's an idiot. Yeah, he's the problem. That is correct. And that's what they want you to hear. But the reality was he was trying to tell you, no, this, we're going to have this retail apocalypse right. unless we need to, unless we shift gears. It's, it's quite fascinating, and we see it all the time. That's one of the other problems that we have in this world, which is we listen to only what we want to hear. Mm hmm Back to that psychology thing, too, because yeah. this is on us now. Right. We hear what we want to hear. Sometimes you need to hear what you don't want to hear. Well, how do you do that if you're the brand executive and mm -hmm. you understand that that's what the customer's mindset is? Mm -hmm. So how do you kind of tackle that? Well, I get in everybody's head. Um, <laughs> and so, <laughs> again, should have paid more attention during psychology yeah, class. Exactly. But one of the things I try and do is no matter who is on the other side of the, the table with me yeah. or – the customer at the other side of the transaction, it doesn't matter. I always try and put myself in their shoes. What are they thinking? Why are they thinking it? Et cetera. Mm -hmm. It's extraordinarily important because you can't guide them to change. One of the things that goes on in this society right now is all we do is point at each other and say, you're wrong. It's not going to drive change. Right. It's just going to be a lot of finger pointing. Right. What you have to really do is you have to guide people to your viewpoints. Mm -hmm. So you're trying to move an organization. You're trying to get them to do something different. If you do like Ron Johnson did and start changing things, you're going to hit a wall at some point. Right. And that's what happened to Ron Johnson mm -hmm. because even CEOs have bosses. Mm -hmm. They're the board of directors. Mm -hmm. You need to understand where those walls are and not be the one to try and force your way through them, which is our traditional approach. We try and bulldoze our way, and this is what kills everybody. Mm -hmm. What you have to do instead is actually bring them to your thinking. Make it their idea. Give, give us an example, right? So uh, I'll, <laughs> that funny example, and this is actually where I learned it. Back Fair to enough. my Vanguard days. See how this all keeps going full circle. Absolutely. So I was a punk manager. <laughs> and what I mean by that is I moved fairly quickly in every organization I, I worked in. So right. as I said, I didn't even have a college degree, but – Pretty much at 20 years old, I was a, in management and store, like senior le store management sure. in these department stores and at 20 years old. Everybody loves a manager <coughs> that's younger than them. Yeah, exactly. That goes over <laughs> so well. And so, so what happens is, okay, I'm in that retail and I take a step back mm -hmm. because I'm working too many hours right. and realizing even though I made all this money, I made a lot of money for that age. It wasn't worth it to me. So then I go into, uh, I step all the way back and actually take phone rep jobs and then work my way back up again. Mm -hmm. And now I'm at Vanguard and I work my way pretty much pretty quickly up to management, which is not that common and that as fast as I did it there. And not only did I work my way up to management, I was actually in their high net worth servicing area. So the people that service people with a lot of money. Right. Uh, so that was even another oddity. But I was brought in very intentionally to help drive change. Mm -hmm. And so I came in with this attitude. And so my first staff meeting, I wound up getting into it with one of this old-time manager who was probably twice my age. Right. Who worked there for years. Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden, we're going at it to the point where people thought we are going to have fists. Okay. And we were completely butting heads. And so I walk out of that meeting. Believe it or not, I walk out of that meeting. I'm tw young 20s. Mm -hmm. I walk out of that meeting going, huh, and I'm smart, and yeah, I'm, I I'm this. Him. I, I showed him. him. Exactly. And, and I, I immediately talked to my boss, and she goes, that didn't go so well in there, Doubt did it? <laughs> well, no, what do you mean? I got my point across, blah, 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 blah. Everybody heard it. Everybody heard it. <laughs> and she turned to me and said, 
We need to teach you some things. Right. First of all, you almost went to fists in there. Why? And she kind of guides me to the thought, which was I was trying to impress her and her boss that I knew what I was doing. Right. And I was living their vision. Right. She goes, first of all, we didn't hire you to try to impress us. Right. We, you already impressed us that we hired you. Right. Get over it. Yeah. The other piece to it is you're not going to get them to your way of thinking by butting heads with them. Right. And what she taught me was you have to learn to ask questions. Mm -hmm. We have to learn to ask questions that guide people down a path to then have, here's my view, mm -hmm. to have, you know, where it's their idea, not someone else's. Mm -hmm. Very interesting thing to do. Mm -hmm. It's not always an easy thing to do either. You only have one mouth. You have two ears. That That's type right. Of thing. Exactly. So you have to step back and you just simply ask those questions mm -hmm. and you keep asking the questions. So it starts off with, well, why do you, why is the process that way? Mm -hmm. And it, oh, well, can you explain to me how it goes this way? And you keep asking more and more questions until the end, there's only really one answer. Mm hmm. And then that way it becomes, oh, well, we need to change to this. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Here's the challenge Turn, to it. It is. turns out it's what Dave says, yeah. right? You exactly. Know. But what do we, the problem we have is we're trying to impress our bosses that they hired the right person. Right. If I guided him to this, what I have to remember, and she told me this, you need to remember, we know why we hired you. We know what you're doing. Yeah. We know you're already smart. Have that confidence. Have that confidence. Yeah. Don't worry about impressing me or trying to get me to see it. Yeah. If you get him to do it, we're going to know it came from you. Right. Don't worry about that. There you go. And so that's the ultimate thing is what you have to do is you have to start getting that deep into it. And part of getting that deep is also asking why. Mm -hmm. Why do we do it this way? Where did it come from? You know, and this is the problem in society right now. We're butting heads all over the place. And yet when I really dig into a lot of these things, people's views are oftentimes quite similar. They just don't see it. Mm -hmm. They just want to butt heads with each other. Because they're taking it as you said I'm wrong, yeah, I said you're wrong, and and that's not what's being said. But when you start asking them questions about where their view, views are, you find there's actually much more alignment sure. than anything in the news media or anything within social media would make you believe. Yeah. But that's because we're too busy trying to impress everybody else about us. Yeah. In social media, what are we trying to do? Look how smart I am, look how good I am. Yeah. And by doing that, all we're doing is creating these walls. I, you know, we're ending where we started. I think that that's uh, <laughs> a, a, a pretty good sign. Uh, customer experience management, CEM Asia, September 12th through the 14th. I promise everybody will have an adventure with me. <laughs> you never know what direction <laughs> things will go, but you will have a lot of fun. I will see you in Singapore. Absolutely. First things first, though, which is last things last, <laughs> which are the three final questions. Yes. So I'll tell you what they are, and then I'll ask you them in order. <laughs> What has most surprised you at work along the way? We kind of covered mm -hmm. at least highlights. <laughs> What's most surprised you in life? And then on the soundtrack of your life, one track, one song that's got to be on there. But first things first. <laughs> All right. What's most surprised you at work? Most surprised me at work is probably the human element mm -hmm. uh, of even the most senior leaders. Right. Talked to earlier uh, the CEO of Comcast. Right. And, the, you know, where I really got to start to understand him and was a day he was there with his family being a normal person. Everyone at all levels, they're all human. Yeah. Treat them that way. Um, and understand that they are. Mm -hmm. That human element is often missing in business, and it needs to be there. Business is personal. Yes, it is. All right. What's most surprised you in life? Um a lot of things surprise me in life. Um, you know, a lot of things I am, I do get surprised oftentimes by, you know, where I see we've gone. I think we've lost a lot of empathy towards each other mm -hmm. and that understanding of each other. And I think it's oftentimes too often because we're trying to impress others. Right. And so, you know, I'm really surprised at the direction that that's gone and how challenging it is right now. Mm -hmm. You know, we need to get back to having that empathy for people and the things that they've been through in their life experiences. You know, I've had some really amazing experiences in my life. I've actually had some horrible ones, mm. you know, and I will tell you, it makes me different of who I am online. It also makes me very different with what I am in business. Yeah. 
You know, so, you know, I actually lost a child uh, for, to cancer oh, before her fourth birthday. But what it, it gave me a different empathy than uh, maybe a lot of other people would not have. Yeah. And so, you know, one of the things I'll say is take something from everything you do. We talked a lot about different experiences I had. And I'll tell you, Vanguard, I got that customer dedication. Yeah. Kind of teased a little bit about Advana. But what I'll tell you, one of the things I didn't say about Advana, which was this small run company, I actually really got to understand employee experience because they're actually extraordinarily dedicated to the employee, not necessarily to the customer, right? But definitely dedicated to the employee, and I, and it, you know one of the, that's where I went through my experience with my daughter in cancer, mm. and you know what they were incredible, right? And so these are all things that add up, and when we start to actually understand those life experiences, you know what? It's not about your college degree or your look how great I am type things. Yeah. These life experiences really can make a difference in business across the board. So uh, just while we're here, uh, you with your daughter, my mm-hmm. mother passed away early on. And mm-hmm. She was sick for a long time and uh, unfortunately passed away. And when you say the empathy uh, mm-hmm. piece, I now, whenever I talk to someone that has lost mm-hmm. a parent early, we already understand everything. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So I'm sure that the community of folks mm-hmm. th- that are in the unfortunate position that you're in, you connect immediately. Mm-hmm. Is that the empathy piece you're it, talking about? It, it, it is, but it's, it's also a little different because oftentimes what do we do when we hear someone had someone who passed? What do we immediately say? Oh, I'm so sorry. sorry. Right. What does that we do? Don't, we don't really – like I don't have – I'm a little cold about that sometimes. Right. But the, you know, but instead, I'll be like, you know, I'll, I'll actually talk to him about, or one of my favorite moments was a friend of ours came over and said, uh, there's not, words can't say anything. That's it. Here's beer. Yeah. And so we now call everything a bring beer moment yeah. uh, when it's a really <laughs> lousy <laughs> situation. Right. Um, but, you, you know, it's that understanding of, wow, you've been through some hard things. Yep. But, you know, one of the things I'll say is we've all been through some hard things. Mm-hmm. We've all been through some amazing things. We need to bring all those experiences into what we do each day. Because guess what? That adds to what the customer experience is. That adds to the employee experience because that is the human experience. On the soundtrack of your life, one track, one song that's got to be on there. I have no clue. I'm so bad with that. Um, well, wouldn't it be, you know, The Streets of Philadelphia by uh, no, Springsteen or something no, like that? No, <laughs> no. Although I do like Springsteen, but no. I, yeah. I'm trying to think through this for a moment. Give me a second on this one. Because <laughs> um, there's got to be an interesting one that I'll... Time in a Bottle. Okay. Wait, is, is that uh, Jim Croce? Yes. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> wow. <laughs> if I could have Time in a Bottle, right? Because, yeah, and it really does come back to that historical piece. Yeah. You know, and being able to pull this all together and everything that we've been through. Yeah. You know, we're not a product of what some book told me. We're not a product of um, what some professor told me. We're a product of all our life experiences. And I would not have had success in business. I would not have had success in my life if it wasn't for all those experiences, good, bad, and ugly. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I really think that that's something that I value in many ways. You know, so, yes, I went through some pure hell. But you know what? That would have, that's what lent itself to actually being able to have success too. Yeah. And, you know, it's taking all those things in. While I was at Comcast, I actually interacted with customers all the time. Yeah. And they often hated the company. And yet I could show empathy for them. I right. could show, I could be, I could understand what they were going through. Yeah. Because I looked at it from their shoes. Yeah. And what their life experiences may be. Mm. So time in a bottle, I think, would be a good one. That's so good. That's such a good one. There's another well-known Jim Croce song that everyone will know. But there's a third Jim Croce song. (laughs) Oh, jeez. Yeah, which has the lyric, and you might remember this. You can tug on Superman's cape. Oh, yeah. You can spit into the wind. You can take the mask off the old Lone Ranger. (laughs) But you don't mess around with Jim, Frank. (laughs) You don't mess around with Jim. (laughs) This has been a pleasure. There it is. I will see you in Singapore, and uh, thanks for doing this. Thanks for doing that, and can't Uh, wait. It's a lot of fun, and I think we're going to have a lot of fun in Singapore. I think the audience is going to have a great time. And there you have Frank Eliason. The retail apocalypse is not Amazon's fault, Frank tells us. When he was a kid going into a department store, it was a full-day experience. What happened over the years is that it became pilot high and make it fly. 
which focused on the numbers, not the experience. Interesting stuff there. Very much appreciate Frank's time. Looking forward to spending some time with him in Singapore. Thank you for your time. Stay tuned.